I'd like to thank everybody for joining us today. Uh, welcome to today's CNCF webinar, Commoditize Kubernetes with Cluster API. I'm Julius Rosenthal. I'll be moderating today's webinar. Uh, and we'd like to welcome our presenter, Gianluca Arbezano, Senior Staff Software Engineer at Packet. So a few housekeeping items before we get started. During the webinar, um, you cannot talk as an attendee. Uh, there is a Q&A box down at the bottom of your screen. So please feel free to drop your questions in there. Um, John Luca will be answering those uh, over the course of his presentation. And then we'll have some time, hopefully at the end, uh, to answer any additional uh, questions. This is an official webinar of the CNCF. And as such, it is subject to the CNCF Code of Conduct. Please do not add anything to the chat or questions that would be in violation of that code of conduct. Basically, please be respectful of all of you, your fellow participants and presenters. Also, the recording and slides will be posted later today to the CNCF webinar page. And with that, I'll hand it over to John Luca uh, to kick off today's presentation. Yeah, thank you for coming and thank you for the introduction. So I have to say that I don't have any slides because I thought that there are many of them about Cluster API already and how it works and why it's there. So I recently joined Packet where I, my first task was to take the Cluster API provider that we have and bring it to, to its new life and move it from V1 Alpha 1, that was the first version of the Cluster API, to V1 Alpha 3. That is the, the newest and shiny one that we uh, are using today. And, um, you know, in the process of doing that, I learned a lot about like components from Kubernetes that are new and that are around how do you provision and install a cluster and how do you manage its, its life, life cycle um, when it's running. So how do you move it or how do you upgrade it and how do you make a cluster uh, to recognize the cloud provider where it is in. So there are a lot of details that as a user and as a you know developer I never really um, thought about and you know I'm, I'm I decided to set this conversation up um, to in this way so I'm gonna share my screen I'm gonna share a bunch of Chrome tabs and a bunch of like my files uh, that I have locally and we're gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna walk through like uh, how Cluster API is made in this way how it works and what it solves and I hope that will work in a little bit more interactive way than or different way than what we use usually saw. Um, those talks are great. I delivered one, one talk about Cluster API a few weeks ago, um, and you know I showed like a demo of how it works on, on Azure and so on. But I thought in this way, it would be a little bit more dynamic. And today is Friday, and here is like 7 p.m., so I'm almost like uh, over my day. So I thought this was gonna be like a little bit more uh, different and dynamic with other people from the community. So I invite you to use the Q&A session since now and also the chat. I have them open uh, nearby my desktop so I can see them. And because you are gonna be able to pilot my talk. And in the meantime that you, know, you figure out what to do, um, I'm gonna you know, give you a brief presentation about what, why I think we are here and why we think we have Cluster API. So in the early days of Kubernetes, it was not that easy to provision uh, the tool because it, it is made of a lot of components that have to talk with each other and provision that is not easy because it, it has to be like solid, it has to be reliable because it, it is the tool that manage your, your liability and the liability of your company and your software. So it has, it, it has some design decision that are made for extendability and that's why it almost runs everywhere. Um, we find Kubernetes in almost every cloud provider, in almost every like very metal provider, because you can get those binaries and install them wherever you are, and you can place them to work with each other, and that's it. And you have a cluster. So this is a. Comp it looks like an easy job when you do a cube admin join or a cube admin init, but there is a lot of stuff that are coded there that you have to know. For example, in the early days, like cloud provider, like Azure and AWS, they were able to um, inject their code inside the Kubernetes API server, inside the Kubernetes core itself. And this was great because, you know, we didn't have many cloud provider at the time and we, um, 
And in this way, you didn't have to do like much work. You just install the, you, you download the binary and you get the cloud provider that you're looking for. But this was like 10 years ago. Now we have um, a lot of different cloud providers. We have a lot of different like cluster that runs on bare metal and those has different needs. And we can't really as a community onboard all of them um, in, a, in the core Kubernetes organization because that would be too much for the maintainers and there is already a lot of work that has to be done. So one of the work that we did was to strip out like the, um, the concrete implementation of the cloud provider, we call them CCM, it is like cl um, cloud computing management and uh, the cloud provider is able to you know, ship a binary that um, act in a concrete way with the cloud provider that it's on. So, uh, and that's why in the kubelet you can do something like um, dash dash external cloud provider, you can do cloud provider AWS and so on. So AWS, as I said, and Azure are in, they will be moved out at some point and there are other cloud provider that has their own uh, implementation of the CCM. And the CCM is that stuff that is able to tell the kubelet and tell Kubernetes that it is running on one particular kind of cloud provider. And it, it takes like all, like full responsibility for, for that. So for example, if you are an AWS uh, user, but it also work with Packet, this is the company I work for and with Azure, when you create a server using Kube Admin, Kube ADM, uh, you will notice that your nodes has particular labels that comes out of the box and are cloud provider related. And I'm thinking about like the instance ID, uh, I'm thinking about the subnet group on AWS and, and those kind of stuff. So those information are managed by the cloud provider uh, component inside Kubernetes. And as I said, some of them are internally, other are external. It really depends on the, on the popularity, but the tendency is to move all of them out so, uh, and provide an easy way to install them. And this is one, piece of the puzzle. Another piece of the puzzle is like, uh, when you provision a cluster, you have like the, the cloud provider itself. So you have AC2 or you have like bare metal or you have like servers and whatever you, you can think about. Those stuff are, um, those cloud providers have their own API and you have to provide the servers that you need to join in a cluster. And this piece, like the, the actor that takes um, you know, the, the actor that takes uh, the responsibility to make a server that just have a bunch of binaries installed to a node of a Kubernetes cluster is called a bootstrapper. And a Kube ADM is one bootstrapper because Kube ADM doesn't really care about how you spin up an AC2. That's something that you have to give to them or they don't care about how do you install binaries inside the servers. You have to provide the kubectl, the kube admin, and all those kind of stuff there, ready to be used. The kube ADM just takes a bunch of information, a bunch of YAML, because everything is driven by YAML, and it makes like a cluster out of it. So you do kube ADM init, and it starts, and you do kube init join, and it join clusters. That's what it's called like a bootstrapper. Uh, there are bootstrappers for, like, QADM is the most famous one, but you can work without it, or you can work with a different one. So you, you probably know that there is a distribution called K3S, that is like a, um, a small, a smallest, like, Kubernetes distribution. And it doesn't use QADM, you can use their own one, that, uh, and that's, like, in a different way. So you have a different bootstrapper that is not, like, QADM. And after that, when you have your bootstrapper, when you have your cloud provider, it's time to get to the point where you create AC2s or you create build from machine or you create like bare metal servers. And how do you do that? Nowadays, you do that with APIs. And, uh, oh, sorry, yeah, it's shaking because I'm emotional. <laughs> uh, so, I'm, so what do you do? It's like you, um, you have to provide those uh, instances and who, gives you the responsibility to, who, who holds that, that task. It really depends on the environment you are. Like I think uh, until like we had cluster API, the more, the, one of the most easy way was uh, via Terraform or via um, um, you know, configuration management. What's the problem with configuration management? The problem with configuration management is that they are st static, even if they try to be as most dynamic as they can, they suffer the same limitation that 
EML suffers when you use like Kubernetes. And I think that the biggest limitation is the fact that you can't really um, generate the YAML or the configuration management for your Terraform in a way that is dynamic as it should be. Because, you know, we are not just creating like a bunch of servers, we are creating servers, we are getting IPs, we have to connect those IPs, we have to install binaries. It's, it's a long process. And Kubernetes, at least for me, he teached me, it teached me how to, um, how our conciliation loop works and how dynamic the configuration and the provisioning of a, of a server or a pod or a network can be compared with something that was way more static, like fixed in a uh, Jinga, Jinga or uh, YAML or uh, Ruby scripts. So that, I think that's the core and that's a lot, like Cluster API is taking, is taking that concept as it, and it is bringing that to the provisioning of full, fully working cluster. So let's think about, let's think for a second about how the pod works. So you do, you define a YAML or you write a, a, a QCTL create command and you press the button. What happens is that it gets to, your request gets to the API server and the API servers like store the request and the kubelet, you know, gets the request and the request gets passed to um, the CNI and the CRI and the, the container gets created. This is very simplistic, but that's how it works. And it doesn't work. It's not a flow that goes like end to end without any like issue or without any latency. There are processes that are asking for stuff to do and there are processes that are giving work to do. So the kubelet asks, what do I have to do? And the API servers, oh, you, I have those stuff to schedule. So do you have place? And the kubelet responds, mm, I'm busy. Sorry, I can't get them because it requires too much RAM. Or the opposite, well, okay, I can, I can take that because I have so much RAM that I can use. So I'm gonna take the pod, the request, I'm gonna place it on my own. And the API servers kicks our conciliation loop that goes over and over and keeps watching across the fleet of clusters uh, across a fleet of nodes if the, st the situation is under control. So if you asked to deploy like four replicas of the same pod via deployment, the reconciliation loop is watching over the cluster, like asking how many pods do I have? And if the kubelets agrees and they have like four pods, you're good because what you ask for is, is what you get. But stuff may go wrong or temporarily and what happens, maybe a pod like gets OM'd, um, killed, and you have to replace that. So it's automatic because it's a reconciliation loop. So you don't have to do anything. You just have to wait for the, for the, the request that says how many pods I have. And this time the kubelet will not respond like four, they will respond two or three. And the kubelet will say, oops, I don't have what I should have. So I'm gonna ask, to reconciliate and reconcile fits the gap, make a plan and fix the gap of, uh, of the difference. And this is the set, those concepts, we can make those concepts to work um, with clusters themselves. And why do we need that? We need that because like Docker and containers and cloud provider like set the conversation up into the, in, in this way. You don't have to think about your staff as a, you know, a friendly path, but you have to think about them like as a cattle. So this is like a rude and uh, not very great metaphor, but everybody understand that. Um, and uh, so in this, and what we got until recently was, okay, I don't care anymore about virtual machine maybe because I have a cloud provider that helps me with that. And I, I have Kubernetes that hides this complexity. So I don't care that much about the host name of my server. I don't care much about the IPs anymore, but we started to care about Kubernetes clusters. And that's not the point for Kubernetes. Like we moved uh, our focus out from servers uh, to Kubernetes clusters because 
technology wasn't ready to simplify that process yet. And usually the complexity is where we get stuck. <laughs> um, like years ago, uh, configuration management wasn't so popular. Cloud provider wasn't so popular. So we were used to have like a bunch of servers. We was giving them a name and we were using them until they, they you know, become unreachable and they break. Uh, we learned along the way that there is a better way. Now we have APIs and that's solved, but we got stuck with Kubernetes as a path. And this is not what we, what we really want as a community. And this is not what the market is asking for. Because if you think about like um, Azure or AWS or um, GCP with their like uh, cluster API, uh, with, with their Kubernetes as a service um, services, they, they keep up and running like thousands of servers, thousands of Kubernetes clusters, and they don't give them a name. Maybe it looks like they care about yours in particular, but I don't think it's true. Right? For them, all of them are the same, and all of them has to work in some way. And I don't think you can get that far in, a con in control of what's happening uh, do, with a configuration management like Puppet, Chef, or Terraform. You have to build a reconciliation loop. You have to have a watcher that looks at the situation, uh, understands the problem, and fix those problems. It's, it's a lot like robotics. So if you think, if you have a robot, like you, you saw those videos, those cool videos from people that work at Boston Dynamics, that they push the robots and the robots is able to balance by themselves. Um, that's how our reconciliation loops work. In, a, in robotics, those reconciliation loops are very, very fast because they have to respond in a reliable way. Uh, in Kubernetes, they will may not be that like dynamic, but they are still a reconciliation. So like when, when a pod gets kicked out from the production pool because it, it um, kills, it's like when you push the robot. So the robot just shakes and gets back on track because there is a reconciliation and there are a lot of sensors that, um, like, you know, the reconciliation asks those sensors, what's going on, what's going on? And it calculates the response. And the response is, oh, maybe I have to balance, uh, you know, the weight on my back and I have to, I have to find the, the right spot to stay uh, up and running. Um, it's the same, it's the same concept. And uh, it's very cool. And I think we should use it way more than what I see used uh, nowadays in programming. Um, so that's it. So the, use that even when you are not in Kubernetes. And Kubernetes, like cluster API works all with um, custom resource definition. So if you, don't, if you don't know what they are, it's one of the reasons about why Kubernetes is so popular. Uh, you with Kubernetes, you can do whatever, I want, whatever you want. Like there, there, there is a project that makes you able to order like a Domino's pizza via kubectl. Um, you can do a kubectl create and you place your order and it gets created and you get a pizza delivered. And this works because like pod services, ingress and all those stuff, they are um, resources in Kubernetes. And as you have them, you can create your own one. Um, the cluster API creates a bunch of them. And one of them is like the cluster resource. The cluster resource represents your cluster and it's made by a bunch of machines. So machines is another um, custom resource definition provided by the cluster API itself. It also provides other stuff like the, the, the machine deployment that works a little bit like deployment in the Kubernetes pods land. So you, it manages like the, the, the number of machines that you have. And it also provides like bootstrap templates that kubeadm bootstrap templates that looks, it's, that looks like a lot like a cube, um, a cube admin config, but it's a custom resource definition. All those um, custom resource definition are used and animated by what is called a controller. So when you create a pod, um, nothing really happens. Like the, the API server gets the request and stores the request and triggers an event. That's it. If there is nothing looking for that event, nothing happens. Uh, luckily for us, the Kubernetes maintainers developed a pod controller and the pod controller is waiting for those events to take action. Um, in, in our case for the pod, it's like reaching to the um, container runtime and creating the containers and making much more, but I'm simplifying here. Um, behind the cluster, the cluster 
custom resource definition and behind the machine custom resource definition, there is logics that uh, reference to a concrete implementation of the machine that your cloud provider supports. So don't think about the machine has like um, the API documentation for an AC2. So it doesn't have fields like security groups or subnets or operating system or YAML role. It doesn't have that um, because that, that's not how it works. It would be too long to support all the cloud providers. So the, um, uh, the cluster has um, the, the cluster has a single like reference to uh, a concrete implementation of uh, the cloud provider. So I wrote the we wrote that packet the packet um, cluster API uh, API provider, and our job as a implementer of a provider is to pro is to provide um, a concrete implementation for a machine and a concrete implementation for uh, the cluster. And all cloud provider has that. So AWS has the AWS machine and the AWS cluster. Um, Azure has the Azure machine and the Azure cluster. GCP has its own, Packet has its own. And what's the responsibility for those? The responsibility is to um, get triggered by the creation of the cluster API machine, but they have the logic to actually create a machine on the cloud provider. So that's where I place the code uh, from the packet API, the packet Go SDK to call the packet API and create a server. The um, cluster API provider AWS in the machine controller has the code that called the AWS SDK and create the AC2 on AWS. So where you can find all this? Let me share my screen. So you can find all those projects on GitHub, like the cluster API is inside the Kubernetes 6. But as I said, the responsibility for the cluster API is to pilot the concrete implementation that every cloud provider uh, provides. So it doesn't have any logic tied to cloud provider itself. It also provides a CLI that is called cluster CTL and the cluster CTL, the cluster cuddle, um, helps you to interact with uh, the creation and update and deletion and move of your cluster. As I told you, every cloud provider has its own implementation and where you can find them. Most of them are inside the same organization, Kubernetes 6. I'm gonna share those links with you in chat. So I don't see much, many questions. I don't see like many ramblings. So just feel free to to leave them there because uh, I need them. <laughs> so as you can see, when you look for in the, in the Kubernetes 6, when you search for cluster API providers, you see them from AWS, vShare, Azure, OpenStack, GCP, um, Docker, DigitalOcean, IBM, Packet. Those are the ones that are there. There are others that are not in the repository, so you can look at them around if you use a cloud provider that isn't there, maybe you can just ask, maybe, maybe they have one. So how does it work? Like, how do you create your first cluster with a cluster API? And this is where, where the stuff starts to become a little bit meta here, because you need to have a Kubernetes cluster to do that. Because as I told you, the cluster API brings the flavor of, the, of Kubernetes into the cluster provisioning job. So it means that you have to need a cluster. You have to, you need a cluster. And yeah, I don't have many suggestions about how to do that. Like I can, I can tell you how to do it locally. I test that with kind. So I create a kind cluster on my laptop and I do the provisioning of new clusters uh, from that kind cluster. You can use Minikube or you have to spin up like a cluster that has to be there. Like don't, don't look at it as a single point of failure because that's a problem that, that's a question that a lot of people do. Um, and like the problem with that is that you, it's not really a single point of failure. It's a Kubernetes cluster. So you can bring it up with all the scalability and resiliency that you need. So you can have a multi-cluster Kubernetes cluster, uh, or you can even use like an as a service uh, 
one just for that purpose. So let's say that for some reason, like, like this project is made because a lot of services are using Kubernetes cluster and they want to have a lot of them uh, because they don't want to have the, to develop the mindset that it is like uh, your dog or your cat and you can really uh, get out from it very, very easy. So um, that's why, you know, you, we, we have that. Um, for example, like um, a lot of SaaS offerings, they use Kubernetes and they will may have like, um, they, they will may need the ability to create like a, a Kubernetes cluster for uh, every customer they have or for every region or seven for every region because you have redundancy. So it's easy to get like to a point where you have like 20, 25 clusters. And those 25 clusters has to be like updated and they have to be moved and they have to be stopped and they have to be uh, migrated. So it's, 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 it's a lot of work and that's why they build that in this way. So yeah, you, have to, you, you need to have one in some way. So find a way to have one that is reliable. There are Terraform models that, do, that, that does that and that's cool enough. Um, when you have one, you install the cluster CTL and the cluster CTL, I'm going to use the documentation here because I like the, um, you know, to, I would like to, to leave you with concrete like pointers that you can use by your own. So this is the documentation for the, you know, uh, cluster API project. And I click on the section two, this is the cluster CLI. The cluster, C the cluster CTL has an init function. And the responsibility for the init function is to provision a vanilla Kubernetes cluster and make it smart enough to be the, the father of all your Kubernetes clusters. And what do I mean with that? You have to uh, do cluster CTL init and tell the, prov the provisioner that you need. So you have to tell, okay, I need to manage my cluster on AWS or I need to manage cluster on Azure, or I need to manage cluster on multiple cloud providers. And what the init function does with the init function infrastructure command is that it, it installs um, like resources that custom resource definition managers uh, that will wait for the creation of the cluster. So if you're wondering about um, like how the packet one word, for example, we have a binary that is called manager and it has the controllers for the packet machine and the packet cluster. And when you do a cluster CTL in it, uh, it goes to the cluster API provider. It looks for the release page that with the new UI, I don't know where it is. Uh, release, okay. <laughs> it goes to the release one. And as you can see, we have the release v303 and here there are yaml definitions and if we download the the yaml one the, the infrastructure component one and i open that with uh vim you can see that it's a long like uh, yaml that has custom resource definition this is the packet cluster one but it also deploys a uh, deployment and the deployment deploys an image that is called, um, I can find it, but it is called like packet infrastructure provider. And uh, I mean, it's a binary, so it's a container. This is the one. And uh, that container contains the manager that is capable of, um, of taking the, the, the request for a machine and and make it concrete on the cloud provider that you are targeting. Uh, I'm just gonna take a break and look at a few questions on the chat to see if I can uh, hook them up in this uh, way. So I want, I know the basic of Kubernetes cluster and implementing some distributed system. Um, yeah, I think some of, apart, like it's a big question. So I hope that some of it is answered already, but I will uh, go with that later. I was playing Cluster API a couple of weeks ago using vCenter as a provider and I had issues with which happens, but what bugged? That's sad. 
I'm going to look for it with WCTR login. Yeah. Uh, how do you troubleshoot that? that that's, that's a cool question. Uh, yeah. Yeah. As I told you, uh, those are nothing more than real like pods. So I can, I can tell you that I did like, I have a kind cluster and I installed, uh, I did like uh, cluster CTL, uh, cluster CTL init infrastructure, infrastructure packet. I already did that for my cluster, so I have everything I need installed. And if you do kubectl get namespace, you see that you have more namespaces here now. So you don't have the traditional like kube system, kube public default that you get normally. You have more stuff and those stuff are coming from the YAML that I, I told you. So my suggestion is um, go to the vshare one and uh, in, the, in the release, um, file on GitHub, page on GitHub, and download that and have a look at, what's go at what they install. Usually they install like a, their provider namespace. So what you can do here is to do like get pod and you get like, this is the, the manager that I told you about. If you do logs dash n cluster packet system and you take this do that, you see that there are like two um, containers running. So if you look for the manager one, you see that there are logs and those logs are the interaction from the code from your cloud provider to the cloud provider itself. So this is where you should see an API failure, for example, if you place a secret token that is wrong and the, the manager can connect to the cloud provider. That's one way to, to look at it. If it doesn't work, if you can't find anything useful here, my uh, second tip is to, is to go above the stack and see, okay, so this doesn't work. Uh, what I'm supposed to do here, I can check for the cluster. So I don't have cluster here, but I'm supposed that you have yours because uh, that's where you find cluster or you get the machines. And when you get the machines, you have the number of machines that, um, that, that you ask for and they have a status and they have errors, so you can check that. If it doesn't work, what you can do is to um, get, the, the, get the pods again from uh, like get, get namespace and you can maybe get the, the, um, the logs from the uh, cluster API uh, manager itself. So if you do, and usually, I mean, by default, it is in the namespace uh, copy system. And this is a controller, and that's the controller that uh, waits for a cluster request and tries to uh, reach the concrete provider implementation, and it follows the life cycle that is described very well in the documentation, in their documentation. So I don't know the top of my head what it is, but they have pretty graphs like this one that are very good to understand the workflows. So if you go in the developer guide and you open the controllers, you see the list of controllers that I told you about. So you have the bootstrap one, the cube admin one, you have the cluster, you have the machine, you have the machine set, you have the machine deployment. Machine deployment and machine set are the equivalent of like replica set and um, deployment, but for machines. You have the machine health check and the control plan. So for all of them, you have the graphs about what they should do. So you can figure out where you are stuck uh, with those graphs and with the logs from the CAPI system or from the um, CAPI cube admin control plan phase or from the CAPI bootstrapper. So my feedback is to look for them and figure out where you're stuck. Um, Another stuff that I do is like I get I do get secret in the namespace where I created the um, the cluster itself because um, at some point in the life cycle of the creation you sh are supposed to get secrets here like uh, the um, I don't know like the the cube config or the um, uh, CI for your for your cluster and so on so if you don't see them there it means that you are stuck in some way along the along the line. So yeah, I mean, yeah, I can, it's a hands-on uh, situation right now because as I, as I said, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's not a, that old project, but it's getting a lot of 
you know, it's a, it's a new project that is getting a lot of like uh, traction and it's not easy for the cloud providers to, um, to have that up running like uh, perfectly. And I'm saying that because even the packet one is like, it, ha it needs a lot of work and love that is, the, is, the, is what I'm working on those days. Um, so yeah, I'm glad that I answered your question. So <laughs> let's get back to my, um, to my talk. <laughs> so if I look at the app demo that I place here, so when you do um, when you do cluster CTL, when when you have your init and everything is up and running, you can do cluster CTL uh, config cluster, and uh, the config cluster creates the cluster itself. So you have to give it doesn't create a cluster; it creates uh, it, it prints out the, the YAML that you have to apply. So I think I did it. So I have it in my uh, cluster config. Yeah, I have that in my, um, you know, history as well. So if you do cluster CTL config cluster C, uh, and you do Kubernetes version, uh, that's, my, that's my dog that woke up. So it's getting excited about cluster CTL as well. So if you heard weird stuff, that's him. Um, so if you get the, if you do this command, you get the, this YAML, uh, yeah, you get this error because you have to pass uh, a bunch of like uh, environment variable. And as you can see, the environment variable are uh, tied to the cloud provider that you are looking at. So in my case is the facility because packet, yeah, let me kick out the uh, dog. <laughs> okay, I'm free. So the, the facility is where you place your cluster. Uh, you, you have to tell the node type, you have to tell the operating system, the pod, C, um, pod like range of IPs, uh, the SSH key and so on. I have them in my, uh, in an M file that I can load. Yeah, that's it, I have them in my M file. So as soon as I do that command again, uh, you will get like this YAML. And this YAML contains like uh, your cluster. And as I told you, like you have the cube config, the cube, the cube admin config that is the bootstrap strategy. And in my case, like the, it, this change based on cloud provider that you are on. Uh, but for example, the AWS and the Azure one, they generate MEI. Uh, so you don't have those scripts to do manually because your MEI already have the packages you need. But as I told you, like we are in the early days of our journey as a cluster API provider. So we support Ubuntu. And uh, as you can see, uh, you get like the, you get like commands about uh, the server itself. So before the, this is telling like, what do I have to do before the cube admin command? You have to do, like, you have to install a bunch of stuff. That's it. What do I have to do after the cube admin command? So the cube, the cube admin command, depending on, on where you run the cube admin config, it can, be, it can be the init or it can be the join. So in this case, the cube admin config is the, this one is for the control plan one. So it is for the, uh, for the manager. So it does, um, it does the init. Uh, you can see that I have a cluster here. And this is the kind cluster from the cluster API component. So there is no reference about cloud provider stuff here because we don't need them, because this is the general one. The packet cluster is the one that we provide as a cloud provider. And you can see here something that is concrete from the cloud provider. But it, does get, it, doesn't get any, it doesn't have any sense for Kubernetes itself. It doesn't have any sense for AWS. It does have sense for packet. Um, machine is the same. So machine uh, is from the cluster API and it doesn't give you any, any information about the packet machine itself. It gives you the information about how the, the cluster API should look at your machine. And there is a reference to the bootstrap and I'm referencing it to the uh, cube admin config that we just saw before. And I'm referencing it to the 
infrastructure. So I'm saying, oh, uh, cluster API, remember that this machine belongs to uh, a packet machine that is called CNCF master zero. And now I have to describe how the packet machine looks like. So as you can see, this is a very verbose and maybe boring task. And that's why we have the kubectl uh, config provider command, uh, kubectl config um, cluster command, because it gives you, this is a template that gets generated for you. So you don't, you don't have to look at it. Uh, I'm using, I'm, I'm showing you that because I think it's a very good way to learn how to troubleshoot or how to understand how it works. And if you have to change something, you have to open this file because maybe the generated one is not enough or because maybe you have to install something that, you know, is not there by default. And you, like right now, the packet, the packet cloud provider doesn't support like machine um, multi-master. Uh, we got a fix upstream from our internal API uh, working like today. So I'm going to work on the multi-master stuff next, next week. Um, but, the worker can be deployed not as a single machine, but as a machine deployment. So when you deploy them as a machine deployment, you get all the benefits that you get from the deployment of pods. So you get a control loop that balances the number of machines and checks how many of them are running, how many of them are stopped, how many of them are stuck, and try to keep the, the number in sync. As we have like 15 minutes, so if you have any question now or ever, um, and uh, so as you can see, when you create a deployment, you have to deploy, you, have, you can't use like the kube admin config that we used before because you need a template. The template has some uh, parameters that has to be um, replaced because they are per server. And as you can see, the packet machine template has like, in this case, they have the same uh, concrete information about the cloud provider. So you have the operating system, you have the billing cycle, you have the facility and the machine type and the SSH name and so on. And this is the kubeadmin Q, Q config template for the worker. And as you can see, it doesn't have, it, it does have the same pre kubeadmin command because I have to install the binaries. This is an improvement that we will do. I think at some point we will have images that you can use so you won't have to do it runtime because it, it is more reliable, safer, faster, way better. But for now, that's what we have. Uh, but you don't have post command config. That is something that we have in the cube admin config for the manager. Uh, we have that because we have to deploy what I told you is the CCM. So the CCM is that component that I told you at the beginning that uh, identifies the cloud provider. Some of the cloud provider like AWS Azure has the CCM embedded inside the kubelet. Uh, right now, this is not something that Kubernetes is doing anymore because there are too many of them. So you have to provide the CCM uh, to the installation. And our CCM is open source, obviously, and it is currently not in the Kubernetes 6 repository, but it is in our uh, packet host uh, repository. So if you are a packet customer and you are wonder, uh, wondering how should I uh, identify my Kubernetes cluster has a packet cluster, you can use uh, the CCM there. Then I don't remember the name now. If I can look for it. Uh, CCM. Yeah, that was easy. Packet CCM. And so this is the CCM. And like technically, this is not tied to the cluster API. This is a binary. This is a, a, a controller that is watching over nodes and it's identifying them as a belonging to packet and it, it is like doing custom stuff that the cloud provider needs. Some of them, as I told you, are like labeling nodes, annotating nodes, and so on. So the so my my tips here is like go there and have a look about how your cloud provider works in practice. So what else? Yeah, there is a troubleshooting guide here. So uh, John, if you are struggling with something, I, I think you should open an issue on the cluster API because I presume there is a lot that we can do in the troubleshooting documentation because it's, it's small um, at the moment. 
so yeah, what's the best way to reach out to, to the community? Um, there is a Slack channel that is called uh, Cluster API, and you can join there and ask questions about um, like the Cluster API itself. It's not really, really tied to the provider itself. There are cloud providers that has uh, their own channel in the Kubernetes um, Slack, so you can jump there and ask. Or there are office hours, uh, so there is weekly meeting that you can jump. They, there are some of them that are per cloud provider and some of them that are for the old cluster API. So feel free to get there and ask a question. They are really good to stay up to date with the new, um, with the new stuff happening in the cluster API. And there is a lot because I can, I, I, as I told you, it's a, it's a new project that is getting really popular because I think it solves a real issue and uh, in a very solid way because I mean, if you think about that, we are managing machines in the same reliable way that we are managing pods. And along those years, we saw that pods are kind of stable and the way we do that is good. So by consequence, I think that um, doing this, using the same strategy, um, you know, is, uh, for machine uh, will go for a long time. So um, how to reach out to me if you have any questions. So this is my website. You can find me on Twitter with the same name. Um, and I do time to time like session like this one on Twitch as well with the same name um, where I code or I like rumble about what I'm doing. So if you have any questions, see you there and my DMs are open. Otherwise, leave it there. We have 10 minutes to go, maybe five, because I think I, my, content, my contents are, are over. And yeah, that's it. I hope it was helpful enough. Um, I decided to go in this way because there is a lot of code, a lot of details, but if you are approaching Cluster API and you just look at the documentation, uh, you don't get that deep. And sometimes to get that deep, you have to implement the cluster API provider, but it, that shouldn't work that way. Um, so I hope that will be useful for you as soon as you will start to play with that. And if you, if you are on packet, feel free to reach out and uh, leave a comment on the issues. There are issues open. So if you leave comments, I'm, we're gonna prioritize them more than others. And yeah, that's it. Thank you for coming. Great. Well, thanks for a great presentation. Um, we um, look forward to seeing everybody else for um, future CNCF webinars. Uh, everybody have a great day. Thanks.